Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Tais Namir, Oakland based educator, activist, artist, and author of Black Boy Poems. Thanks for joining us, Tyson. And a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions through the QA and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. Tyson, it's so good to see you. It's so wonderful to have read your, your book, Black Boy Poems, and your curriculum, uh, which you are using to disseminate some of these lessons that come from your own experience. Uh, let's talk about you. Let's talk about your book. And let's talk about today, because today you protests are, are, um, are permeating America, and, and those protests are important, but more important is to take action. And that's, that's uh, part and parcel of what we're talking about here today. Mark, I appreciate the invitation. It's really good to be here. I know you and I have been talking quite a while about being able to do something. And it's funny that uh, this moment has allowed for this to happen. So it's great. It's great to be here. And then with everything that's going on in our society right now, I think this is a very important conversation. So, yeah, uh, I am the author of Black Boy Poems, the Black Boy Poems curriculum and many other things. I'm the founder and director of an organization that's called the Black Literary Collective. I'm also the founder and director of uh, an education consultancy firm called Freedom Soul Media Education Initiatives. So much of what Black Boy Poems focuses on and Black Boy Poems curriculum and then a number of the programs that I've developed and, and have been implementing with schools, school districts throughout the Bay Area, throughout California and beyond is rooted in being able to combine the forces of all of those different institutions that I've, I've, I've either created or been a co-founder of. And what's, what's so important here is that the incitement to action that came from George Floyd's killing, Amon Arbery's killing, from the killing of so many other men and women, that incitement to action is actually just another event in four centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, disparities based in racism. Uh, talk about that four centuries. Talk about how you have accessed that history yourself, a history that mm -hmm. is not necessarily told in our schools. Um, and, uh, and you're bringing that history to light. Yeah. I mean, it, our information is power. There's, so there's a line that has been passed on a lot in my community, and I wrote it in the book, but then I, I put my analysis on it. And I added something to it. So your people will say knowledge is power. I said, nah, I push back against that. I say knowledge is power when it's put into action because you have a lot of people who are informed, but if we're not doing anything with that information, if we're not moving based on that understanding, we're not truly maximizing the power of that information. And so from, if, if we wanted to relegate it to, that four century experience, 400 years. So you'll hear that a lot for people who are the descendants of African peoples here in what is now being defined as the United States of America. So I'll, I reference colonial and constitutional America in order for us to be able to deal with that entire 400 year span. But it's bigger than that too. I mean, you had Columbus 1492 and then shortly after that you had the Spanish and then eventually Portuguese traders who started to forcibly enslave peoples stolen from the African continent and brought them over here to the Western Hemisphere. So by the early 1500s, 1502, 1504, 1510, you start seeing the experience of African peoples under colonial occupation. And then of course, we can't discount the experience of the indigenous peoples here in the Western Hemisphere. So although the experiences of the indigenous and African folks are different, they're intertwined in many ways. So you have these two peoples who begin to experience which evolves over time and becomes institutional and becomes systemic, whether we're talking about in the Caribbean, we're talking about in South America, we're talking about in North America. So then the British, they found their first successful colony here in what is now referred to as the United States in 1607, which is Jamestown, Virginia. So then 1619, that's the first time they have African peoples being brought to that colony. And then from that time forward, you have seen different manifestations of institutional oppression, systemic oppression, and then capitalism being weaponized with the evolution of a justification 
which many people want to refer to as racism, and that's fine with me. And so then those two things being coupled together, forming the foundation of what we see, and then every century it just becomes more and more vicious, more and more, um, as we start moving into the 20th and the 21st century, harder for people to identify. So some folks say covert, but it's, you could say it's just as overt as what it was prior to the Civil War. We could talk about after the Civil War, moving into the uh, separate but equal because of the Plessy v. Ferguson decision of 1896. I mean, we. I think we'll get into some of that stuff, but it's it's so deeply embedded in the core, in the psyche, in the foundation of whether we're talking about colonial or constitutional America, of course it's still here. And it it rears its head in all these different places, but then because of social media, because of uh, technology and how it is advanced and we have cameras on our phones, we're able to capture some of the most egregious aspects of it. And then what happens, we see it, people will respond. But then we're still not responding in a way that's addressing those systemic causes of it. So we're responding to how outrageous it is and that response is necessary. So I'm not critiquing the response, the response is necessary. But if we're serious about trying to change what has happened, and as you mentioned, we have a 400 year foundation that we're standing on, we gotta do more than just protest in the street. We gotta do more than just call for the arrest of whatever police officers are responsible for the death of this black or brown life. That needs to happen, but there needs to be more as well. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we, we, can, we can break some more of that stuff down, but that's some of what is the, the backdrop or how we can describe the backdrop that's framing many of the events that we see taking place in the present moment. And what you're describing is the journey from people being people to people being placed literally in not only categories, but in pens, in order to separate people by uh, skin color and create a group of people who are less than people and a group of people who are privileged. And you have that permeate different elements of society as that meets um, human beings' natural desires to uh, help themselves, uh, to help themselves become more prosperous in comparison to others, to concentrate wealth and power, which is we're all trying to do when we're earning a living, we're trying to concentrate wealth. So you have a very natural inclination with a very pernicious uh, element to it, because one way you can accumulate power is to disempower somebody else and take their power or their wealth for yourself. So you have these, these interesting natural tendencies that are then leveraged in these very nefarious ways to create divisions. And we see that actually reflected today in your critique of, of capitalism, for example, a very natural desire to compete and to win and to accumulate. And then you match that with one of the easier ways to accumulate is to create disempowered groups and withdraw their wealth and concentrate them in yourself. And you have these, these forces that together become complementary to the detriment of a whole group of people. Yeah, I hear you on that. I think that's a whole nother conversation if we were gonna do a, a critique of capitalism and the evolution of it. Um, so one of the revolutionary ancestors that's very important to me, and I'll, you might hear me use that term uh, again in the conversation, but as Dr. Huey P. Newton co-founded the Black Panther Party, and I'm here in Oakland right now. Oakland, of course, is the birthplace of the Black Panther Party. Uh, one of the things that he said among thousands, if not millions of brilliant things that he said, he said that there are two evils that we have to defeat. We have to defeat capitalism, and we have to defeat racism. So the natural inclination part, I, I think that's something that is subject to a deeper analysis but the desire for people to be able to have what they need to exist in a moment in time, that I definitely think is important. But then when we begin to look at, when we begin to look at the motivations of the early colonizers, so Christopher Columbus, an Italian who was selling on behalf of the Spanish um, empire at that time, it was very clear. I mean, you, a number of the conquistadors, they said that they were out for God, gold, and glory. 
that's not natural inclination. <laughs> if you're saying I'm out for glory and part of me trying to obtain glory is to obtain wealth by any means necessary. And if that becomes part of the mantra or the motivating force behind what you want to do to acquire these things. And when you encounter people, you're going to discount who they are because they're in the way of you getting your glory and they're in the way of you getting your gold. And then you can appropriate a spiritual or religious philosophy and find a way to try to make that accommodate what you're doing or justify what you're doing. Then we're moving beyond the idea of this is a natural inclination or this is a healthy thing that happens inside of a people. This has become something else. It's become a, a weapon, a justification for your egregious and what some might claim are evil behaviors. And then because the Spanish start doing it, then the Portuguese want to follow and they want to follow under a similar model. And then you have other European countries that begin to do the same thing. And you start seeing what can become the puzzle pieces or the building blocks of what we now see. Because if we're talking about a natural inclination, then how do we get to this point where all right, I, I need some food, I need some land, I, I want a house, I want, okay, so we, we should be able to find some balance with that. But what we see is so far removed from balance. But that has been happening since the first day of contact for indigenous folk. And then, of course, the people that I'm a descendant of, you know, you had Europeans and African countries that were trading for centuries prior to uh, what we see with Columbus in 1492, because you had you have what historic Western historians like to refer to as the Moors, the Moors being in certain parts of Europe. Um, you had, uh, before we get to um, the fall of Granada in 1492 as well, you had various Muslim empires that, encount that incorporated certain aspects of Western Africa, some parts of Central Africa. So you had this, this vast network of people interacting with each other. And you have folks who acquired a great amount of wealth. I mean, you know, my bad for, for speaking so much on this, but if we look at who historians believe is the wealthiest person ever in the history of our species, you refer to Mansa Musa, Mansa Musa, who came from the Malian Empire. Mansa Musa had a net worth of almost a trillion dollars, you know what I'm saying? And that was not acquired by forcibly exploiting other peoples, you know what I'm saying? So when we begin to look at what other peoples have done with wealth, how they acquired it. And then you compare that to what has happened over the past 500 plus years. This is a very different example of how we wanna accumulate wealth, what we wanna do with wealth, and then how we view people on the other side of that wealth. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that's also very important for us to analyze this experience that we are now byproducts of in the 21st century in this moment this is a very different experience when we begin to compare and contrast it with other epochs of our species. And we, and, can, we can heal, we can take these ideas of there can be nefarious intent and innocent intent, and we can change ourselves so that the innocent intent is actually strengthening us all and not disadvantage, disadvantaging one group to the advantage of another. We can, we can change this dynamic. How do we change this dynamic? How do we create a collaboration that crosses racial boundaries that have been uh, so reinforced and continue to be reinforced through our contemporary politics? How do we, we create collaborators, which we seem to be seeing in the streets? I mean, these, the Black Lives Matter protests seem to be multiracial, multiethnic, multigender, multigenerational. Um, it seems like like we're we're coming to a new awareness. How do you, how do you in your work in Black Boy Poems, which is completely accessible to a white guy like me, how do you how do you change how we use these various elements of America mm -hmm. to help each other? I, I think that's a great question, Mark. I would begin with our history again. Um, there's so much in that 400 well, years. Well, I have span. to learn about your history in order to be prepared. Well, I think it do. wouldn't be necessarily learning about my history. That is important. I think it's more about learning more of our history. So if we wanted to keep it just in the 20th century, and I mentioned the revolutionary ancestor, Dr. P. Newton, co-founded the Black Panther Party. During that time, so we can look at the late 60s, we can start moving into the early 70s. 
there were so many powerful examples of groups or communities that are different. You had Latino community and different aspects of the Latino community, Puerto Ricans, folks who at that time identified as Chicano, Chicana. You had uh, folks who identified as Chinese. You had folks who identified as Japanese, Indian from the Indian subcontinent. And of course, our native or indigenous brothers and sisters here, they form coalitions. And then in Chicago, Chicago is a very important example because I don't know how many people are familiar with the history of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, but you had a very powerful young brother by the name of uh, Chairman Fred Hampton, who was assassinated by Chicago PD, FBI, participation as well on December 4th, 1968. But he formed something called the Rainbow Coalition. In that Rainbow Coalition, you had a group called the Young Lords. So there's a group of Puerto Rican young folks in Chicago. You had a group called the Young Patriots. And this is a group that's also very important for us to research and, and to look into. It was a group of young white folks, and they were from the hills of Appalachia. They moved from the southern part of the United States into Chicago. And what they began to experience, because they were being identified as poor white folks within the Chicago structure, that they experienced police brutality, they experienced housing insecurity, they experienced food insecurity. And so they began to look around for folks who might be able to assist them in their struggles. And so they ended up clicking up or connecting with the Black Panther Party, who was connecting with the Young Lords and other institutions in Chicago. They became a very powerful institution, and that's part of the reason why Chicago PD, the FBI, under COINTELPRO, was afraid of a young brother by the name of Fred Hampton. And another brother that was killed from the Black Panther Party on December 4th was a brother by the name of Mark Clark. And I'm saying in our history. So if you wanted to look at your own history, Mark, we have examples of that. And that's just me pulling from one moment. We can go back into the 50s. We can go back into the 40s. We can go back into the 30s. We can go into that. So we can see powerful moments of communities coming together, but those are things that are not as that not emphasized as much as some of these other things that we see. And that's because when we experience our history, when we look through our history, we're looking at it through a colonial lens or often through the lens of the people who have set up the system that we're, we're under, and they're not going to give us the recipe for our own freedom and liberation. So in we can, uh, we can go as far back as the 1600s and the 1700s, and we will see how communities have come together to support themselves against the oppressive systems that they feel that they're facing and how they've responded to that. And I think that history is very important and then seeing how we can connect some of that to this present moment. And I think what you're saying is key. We do have an example of that right now where there are a lot of folks from different communities that are out there in the streets. But as we said at the very beginning of the program, the protests are great, we have to do more than that, that is addressing some of these systemic issues. And so using the example of the Rainbow Coalition, they were focused on those systemic issues. They protested, they had signs, they did a lot of that stuff, but then they did a whole bunch of other things in addition to that that were focused on an agenda of freedom and liberation of oppressed peoples. And they had strategies and tactics to make that happen. So in our true histories, I believe we can find a number of examples of communities coming together, and this is a very popular term that we use now, allies, communities coming together and supporting themselves in an agenda for freedom and liberation, addressing the systemic causes of their problems, and then finding ways to do something about that. We have that. And in that, we can learn more about each other, which is also a good thing. But like, I don't need you, Mark, to become an expert on black culture and the black experience to be somebody that you know i can work with the same thing i don't think you need me to become an expert on your history and culture i should have an understanding and an appreciation of it but i don't have to become a master or phd or doctor level uh understanding of it in order to be able to stand in solidarity and, and, and fight alongside you if you and your community are dealing with an issue especially if that issue impacts my community as well you're combining Lincoln's point of, of us being bound together by mystic cords of memory with mm -hmm. Douglas's point that we must agitate, agitate, agitate. And, and that whole idea of together we are bound by memory and we are together bound by this call to action that encompasses us all. Um, what actions can we take now? Now that we've, we've expressed this uh, solidarity in an understanding that there is a problem, which at this moment in time, that understanding seems to be as never before um, and seems to be embraced 
um, in a huge way, today's uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling that, um, that uh, um, embraces the rights of uh, members of the LGBT community uh, to receive uh, certain coverage and consideration in, in our laws is, is another step in that direction. How do we now take this moment of, of, of shared experience and shared understanding and convert that into something that on a sustained basis sets the stage for, for real change that allows us all to pursue an American dream that encompasses everyone and that starts to heal these four centuries of mm -hmm. racism and racial disparity and, and race embedded systematically into our institutions? That's the big question, Mark. I don't know if that's the question that we're going to be able to answer in, uh -huh. in this broadcast. You know, we've been, uh, when, when we look at what, what people have been organizing for over the course of these different centuries, that question is what people have been answer, are, are trying to answer. So in, like in the history that I come from, and this is touching on a question that you had asked a little bit earlier, like I'm a direct descendant of people who fight, who have been fighting for their freedom and liberation for centuries. The furthest that I can go back, because records were not kept by my family, they were kept by people who believed they had the ability to own my family, is to the early 1800s. And in that time, I have ancestors that were in West Virginia, and then I have ancestors that were also in Georgia. And this is just on my father's mother's side, so my grandmother's side. And I have ancestors that were forcibly enslaved in the state of Georgia. By the start of the Civil War, my great-great-great-grandmother, my great-great-grandfather were sold by the person who believed he owned them from a plantation in Georgia to a plantation in Alabama. They were sold for $1,500. A man, and so my great-great-grandfather was around 11 at the time, and then my great-great-grandmother. So two people sold for about $1,500. Towards the end of the Civil War, my great 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 grandmother and great great grandfather walk all the way back to the plantation where my great 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 grandfather was at in order to reunite the family because they weren't going to allow that system that unjust system to have their family separated they were going to do everything in their power to reunite but prior to that and throughout that they wanted to fight against that system in order for them to be free and everybody else that was in that same condition to be free and then of course after the civil war it just changed. It manifested in a new way and still fighting against the injustices of the system. So I'm, I've been a byproduct of it generation after generation after generation. You got brothers and sisters out there in the streets right now still saying Black Lives Matter, freedom and liberation for all people. And so I'm from the early 1800s and my people were here before that. They've been fighting for that. And so that's been the clear goal. But what I feel is happening in the present moment, and there have been other moments like this before this moment that we're in right now in 2020. We want to see cops arrested. Defund the police is a great thing as well. But if we're not addressing what's behind that, what has built those things up in the first place, then we're not, we're not getting there. We're not addressing those root causes of what's going to make this happen again in a couple of months. But a big piece of what we do see that I think is part of the solution, we have people who are coming together. That's powerful. As the Black Panther Party used to say, power to the people or power to people. That is power. But when we can get those people together and then we can have an informed agenda, which is where we started talking from the very beginning, that is rooted in a strategic and a tactical approach to how we can begin knocking down this the systemic institutional aspect of what we're facing, then we start moving towards those solutions. So you're and what that looks like is going to be different, you know, because this is not uh, Dr. King's 1968. This is not Malcolm's 1965 or Huey's 1966 when the Black Panther Party was created. There's a lot that we're going to learn and then we can take from that, the, the, the discipline, the strategies and the tactics of those times. But this is a different time. I mean, you and I, we're having this, this interview through Zoom at 8.25 in the morning right now. So being able to, to harness the power of the technology that we have, whatever else is going on that's moving the people socially and culturally, we gotta bring those things in. And then the, the institution or the machine has evolved as well. So we have to take all of that into account in our critical analysis of what exists in the conditions that we're experiencing right now and begin to move that way.
but a piece of, I think, that answer we are seeing. We have people coming together. There's so much power in the people. But we need that, that next layer of, of understanding and then a true focused agenda on what we're trying to accomplish. All right, if the cops get locked up, if they get charged and they get locked up, does that mean we're done now? Nah, we're not done. There's much more that we have to do. And it's not just, it, all of us have an issue with race. It's not just police. I mean, your point is that if you take police who intentionally murder a black man and you prosecute them, that's not enough. If you take people who are um, intentionally creating these distinctions based in race, that's not enough. And even if you take a philosophy like Dr. King's philosophy of, of, uh, of just peace or uh, uh, Malcolm X's uh, philosophy uh, by any means necessary uh, to tear down the system, none of that is enough. If you're going to create systems change, you have to take a systems change approach. You have to really bring all these different ideas to bear and you have to uh, take different tactics and apply them appropriately to the particular situation, a particular town, a particular rural area, a particular state, to a particular situation. And we have to become as systematic in our deconstruction of racism in this uh, country as it was systematically built. Definitely, definitely. And, and all the names that you mentioned had that understanding. So we could talk about Dr. King, Dr. King, and on April 3rd, 1968, the day before he was killed, he was organizing sanitation workers. And he had already launched for people's campaign, which was a systems uh, approach to change. He said, we live in a society that is unjust in, in, in many ways. Part of that is the economic injustice that people are experiencing, the economic inequality that exists in our society. Describing the United States as a United States of two different Americas, two different experiences. And so we have to organize and address this systemically. So Dr. King had that analysis. We can talk about Malcolm. Malcolm had that same analysis. Malcolm wanted to have the United States charged in the courts of the United Nations for its treatment of Black people and other oppressed peoples, thinking, how do we address this systemically? And then if we, we look at the Black Panther Party, the Black Panther Party had a similar analysis. They wanted to pick up and evolve the understanding of Malcolm. They talked about uh, having the United States charged. But then in addition to that, the Black Panther Party created what they called survival programs, but it was survival pending revolution. So if people don't have food, all right, we're gonna get free breakfast for the kids. We're gonna get food for the community. If they don't have health care, we're gonna create clinics where people will have health care. They don't have housing, we'll build housing. So they were addressing those systemic things and their understanding was we have to do this now in order for the people to be strong and to become stronger, to participate in a full out or all out revolutionary struggle to create change. And then going back to Malcolm's statement that you quoted, the by any means necessary, that's very important. The way that it has been taught back to us by the oppressor or the colonizer is that is a statement that simply equates violence. Now, if we're talking about by any means necessary, if there are 15 possibilities on the table, we exhaust all 15 possibilities. And the last possibility is the one that means potential loss of life. Because in a revolutionary struggle, you're always trying to live to fight another day. You're not just trying to be out there killing yourself. You know what I'm saying? So if we can accomplish it by using tactic your, your uh, sound ca cut out, but what you were saying is we can use these different tactics. One tactic could be housing. Another tactic can be, um, it could be uh, ensuring that people have food security or financial security. Another tactic can be just interactions with, uh, with the police to figure out how to reduce implicit uh, bias or, or change the resource allocation, which is really what uh, defunding police does not mean eliminating police, it means changing how uh, we allocate resources to, to, uh, to communities. Uh, is your sound back now? I hope so. Yeah. I, I really yeah. hope so. We hear you. Uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, Tyson, thank you so much for sharing the work of Black Boy Poems. Uh, attendees, thank you so much for, again, participating in these very important discussions. Please keep these discussions going. 
uh, in your communities. That's the nonprofit report. And let's keep going. Let's, uh, as Tyson said, convert words and education and interactions into action. Mm -hmm.